In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me. A sinner. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Alleluia. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Alleluia. is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Alleluia. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Alleluia. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie, Kyrie, eleison. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie, Kyrie, eleison. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie, Kyrie, eleison. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie, Kyrie, Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson for the third Sunday of Easter is written in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, 34. Excuse me. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed on a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second lesson is written in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 2. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. 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 The Lord was known to them in the breaking of the bread. I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. Alleluia. 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 The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory be to you. words of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd, and everyone loves the good shepherd. The picture, at least. You know the one, don't you? The picture of Jesus carrying his little lamb over his shoulders or tucked safely under his arms. The setting drawn from Psalm 23, that of of green, rich, lush pastures, still quiet waters. The shepherd is clean, gentle, happy, nice, smiling. And the sheep too, clean. Their fleece as white as snow, soft, cute, and happy too. And indeed, it is a beautiful picture, a most beautiful picture that the scripture paints for us of Jesus as the good shepherd. It is beautiful because the shepherd is good. His love, his care for his sheep is tender and deep, but but the reality of the reality of shepherding, whether in the world or in the scriptures, is not always nice. It's almost never clean or soft or safe. Neither the shepherding nor the following of the shepherd is nice or pretty. Instead, this life is fraught with dangers, deadly predators, willful wandering sheep that put the flock and the shepherd at risk. It's dirty work, dangerous work for the shepherd. And sheep are filthy, disgusting beasts, caked in their own filth often, wandering their own way, putting them at risk of predators, of dangers, even the dangers of sin and death and hell. And therefore, the shepherd, the good shepherd must be, if he is to be our good shepherd, he must also be a dirty, suffering, bloody, dying shepherd. And to follow the shepherd means to pick up a cross and carry it after him. That is, it means suffering too. And so St. Peter in our epistle for today writes to Christians, huddled together in little flocks all across Asia Minor, as if to ask them, you want to follow Jesus? And he says to them, to this you have been called to suffer as Jesus suffered for you. He says to them, you were as sheep who had gone astray, but now you've returned to your shepherd and overseer. Well, that's something that the prophet Isaiah had said 700 years earlier. He said, we all like sheep have gone astray, each of them to their own way. See, what makes going astray the wrong way is that it's not the way of the shepherd. So you know that picture of the green grass and the quiet waters? That is where the shepherd leads. That is the way that his way, the way of God's holy will, the way of God's law leads. It is given to us for our good and our everlasting pleasure. And even here and now, it is the way he has designed us and our world to work in perfect harmony. But we have gone our own way. The way we were thought best, felt best. Which was the way of our own natural, sinful inclination. It's a way that seemed good to us, but in the way, in the end, leads to death. It's a way that leads away from everything that is good. 
and toward all the apparent goods of this created world. Going away, astray, turning aside from God's law and his good created order for our lives is a death sentence. You were like sheep who had gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd. You have returned, Peter says. But how? It's it's not like you wandered back in the way you wandered out. Either on purpose or by accident. There, There is only one way that your own way leads. That's not God's way. That way, your way, leads to death. That's hell. So the only way to return to the shepherd is really if he comes to find you. Which means only if he goes into the danger. Into your danger. Even if he goes into the very shadow of death that you wandered yourself into. And of course, the only way that God could do that as our good shepherd is that God would come and take on mortal flesh, our flesh, to really come into the very shadow, valley of the shadow of death, and to suffer for you in his body. That is, he doesn't bring you back by just calling and coaxing you. He doesn't just try to persuade you, entice you, or even bribe you to come back. He doesn't try to get you back to himself by making himself or the flock or the green pastures and quiet waters of his will attractive and appealing to you. We were too stupid for that. The only way to bring us back is for him to go into the danger ahead of us, into the darkness, into the danger, into the death and the grave ahead of us. To go there, to stand before the judge who judges justly, having committed no sin, to be sin for us and to suffer everything that belongs to sinners, everything that has been caused by our wandering. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. So, so, so in my mind, the, the very best picture that we could have of the good shepherd is in his body on the tree. Your shepherd saves by suffering. And even after his resurrection, after he has gloriously risen from the dead, even now, as he would stand before you, as he stood before his disciples, he is still your crucified shepherd. Though he has risen, he still, as we saw last week, still unashamedly bears the marks of his suffering in his scars, his wounds. And even now that he has ascended to the right hand of God, this is how he shepherds you. By reminding you, by showing you, even even feeding you from his wounds, from his suffering. And so when he says to you, come, follow me, he means repent. He means return. Work, and he works that repentance in you by his blood. By his love poured out in his blood on the cross. And, and so then following him begins for you a life of suffering after him. He set for you a pattern, a model. He's laid down footsteps in which you are now to walk. Indeed, they lead to green pastures and quiet waters. 
But as long as we live this side of the grave, they continue through the valley of the shadow of death. There's no way to follow Jesus without suffering and death. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, Peter continues, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. It was your sinful flesh that made you wander. But now, baptized into his death, we now crucify that sinful nature every day in us because in Christ you are a new creation, a new man, ready to rise each day in righteousness. And sometimes that dying to sin hurts. It causes its own kind of suffering to not do what my sinful nature wants to do, but what I have been called in Christ to do. And on top of it, you have been called to suffer for righteousness' sake, for doing and saying what is right. For the truth may no deceit be found in our mouths either. But we can prepare to be insulted as Jesus was, attacked, and expect no justice or retaliation here on earth on this side of the grave. On the other hand, you can expect full justice from the one who judges justly. Of course, the only way that this makes any sense at all, to to willingly suffer following after Christ, the only way that this makes any sense at all is, in fact, in the very suffering of Jesus. The only way that we can understand or begin to learn or tolerate or even rejoice in suffering, in hurt, in wounds, both physical and emotional and psychological, is for us to take our refuge in the wounds, in the suffering of Jesus. By his wounds, you have been healed. Yes, from your sin and the suffering that it causes, but also from healed from the sins of others, from their insults, vicious attacks, abuses. Every wound, every hurt that they would inflict upon you, your shepherd has borne in his body And through his suffering binds promises to bind up your wounds and to heal you forever. It's very important for us that our conception, our picture in our head of the good shepherd pictures him, sees him as the shepherd who suffers. And we, his sheep, are glad to follow wherever he leads. If that is through suffering and sorrow, so be it. Because we know in the end where he leads. And it will be twice as nice, twice as peaceful, twice as beautiful as we could ever imagine or dream of before. For there, in his suffering for you, you have his goodness and mercy. And this goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now in confession.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the good shepherd of Israel, who has sought out his sheep and gathered us with them into one flock, would keep us always in his fold and guard us from every wolf and snare. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that God would send faithful shepherds to care for his flock here and scattered throughout the world, that he would keep them devoted to Christ and his truth and so turn them in dutiful service toward his people, that God would spare us from hirelings who serve ego, belly, or the world's doctrines, and that he would give discerning ears to his sheep to listen to the voice of Christ, our good shepherd. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of good government, that as the Paschal Lamb has wrought peace between man and God, so he would grant peace and good days also to our citizens and between the nations of the world, that we and all our neighbors may lead quiet lives in godly contentment. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In thanksgiving for our risen Christ, the first fruits from the dead, who has secured forgiveness for our troubled consciences, that he would also bless us with temporal health to those who suffer, and that he would grant us aid not only in this moment, but even more so true immortal health in the world to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the Holy Communion today, that our good shepherd would calm all fears in this valley of the shadow of death through the holy table here prepared in the presence of our enemies, that he would give us repentance and an increase of faith, and that in every tribulation or besetting sin, he would lead us to find comfort and strength in the overflowing mercy given us in this sacrament. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, out of your fatherly goodness, you have remembered us poor, miserable sinners and given your, holy, your beloved Son to be our shepherd, not only to nourish us by his word, but also to defend us from sin, death, and the devil. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that even as this shepherd knows us and helps us in every affliction, we also may know him, trust him, and seek help and comfort in him, heartily obey his voice, and obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, but chiefly we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb, which was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Almighty God, endless is your mercy and eternal is your reign. 
Out of love you created us and everything which exists. In mercy you preserved the church in Noah's day with a flood. In grace you promised to bless us through Abraham's seed. With patience you protected that seed through the judges and kings of Israel. In faithfulness you repeated your promises through the prophets. And when the time had fully come, you sent your Son, born of a woman, born under law to redeem those under law, with a perfect and sufficient sacrifice, which paid the price for the sins of the entire world. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, gracious Lord, we bow before you in thankfulness for your many and varied gifts, for Christ's redemptive death, his victorious resurrection, his ascension promises, and his powerful reign at your right hand. Bolstered by your endless grace and Pentecost spirit, we eagerly await his glorious return. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated. You guys could go. Good morning. Before we go this morning, I would just like to give uh, an opportunity. Pastor Gerald Geiger is here, uh, and he would will speak to you for a few minutes uh, about his work with Kingdom Workers. So I'll allow him. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I will attempt to summarize 
Whatever you don't hear, you can go to kingdomworkers.com and learn more. Kingdom Workers is a ministry that augments, supplements, or enhances whatever Wells or Ells ministry is already engaged in doing to, to provide opportunities to express Jesus' love, usually through humanitarian aid, to open doors to share the message of Jesus' love. If you wish to receive more information, the, the guest registers uh, are going to be handed to you and you can choose to put information in there if you so desire. Uh, we have many programs or areas of ministry around the world. Just briefly, in Malawi and Zambia, Africa, we are here reaching out to those who are disabled because if you're disabled in Africa, you're considered bewitched or cursed and you have to remain in your hut because otherwise you'll pass that curse on to someone else. But now by the grace of God, with therapy and the word of God, many children are learning how to walk and talk. We have a similar ministry in Japan and also in Grenada. In the United States, we have a, a similar ministry in that we do the Jesus Cares ministry now. We are responsible for the administration of Jesus Cares, uh, formerly under the administration of the Lutheran Home. This is an area of ministry that can be engaged in, in any area, reaching out to group homes usually of those who are mentally or physically handicapped and sharing the message of Jesus' love, usually coming to a worship activity once a month and a Bible study activity another time during the month. <laughs> Most familiar to people relative to the ministry of kingdom workers is Builders for Christ. We now have Kingdom Construction. Under Kingdom Construction, we have Builders for Christ. We are currently finishing a project in Paradon, Arizona, where we built a school. And we last summer finished a school building in Hutchinson, Minnesota. And this summer, we're going to be building an enlargement to a school in Wyawiga, Wisconsin, and West Bend, Wisconsin. We also have a foster family support program where it reaches out to those who have foster children in your community. Foster families generally quit after less than a year, but if they have support, they will continue longer. What can you do for a foster family? You, can get, you have to be 18 and get fingerprinted so you can babysit. After that, you can provide a plate, plate of cookies, you can stop by and say thank you, you can give them a gift card, you can have a group activity in your community. Uh, just endless opportunities for you to express Jesus' love to those who are fostering children. We also carry on ministry in other areas of the world, and I'm going to give you this brochure as you leave because otherwise I'd be here for a long, a long time, uh, which summarizes everything that current Kingdom Workers is currently doing. I will be available in the entryway if you wish to ask a question, and I'll do my best to answer that question also with your questions. One other quick area, under Builders for Christ, we have Build Up. Build Up is a program that engages teenagers in the use of school of construction skills. Uh, this is a program that can be initiated in a congregation. The concept is an adult who knows how to do a certain construction skill invites a teenager to participate in that activity at the church or in the community someplace. A relationship is developed between the, the teenager and the adult and is much more likely to stay connected to the church. So think about ways in which you can express Jesus' love in your community to open the doors to share the message of Jesus' love. If any of the Kingdom Worker activities assist you in that, please take advantage of them, uh, connect with Kingdom Workers, and they will give you some guidance and advice. In, at the end, in the entryway, I also have some additional materials from Kingdom Workers, plus some of my wood designs for donations to Kingdom Workers, if you should, should be so interested. Thank you, thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be here today. I am grateful that the Lord is continuing to bless your ministry in so many ways. And may the sunshine of the risen Savior continue to warm your hearts and use you to warm the hearts of others. Thank you.